I'm a friend. <laughs> I'm a friend. Yeah. 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 Well, the she's going to the right, right? Yeah. Depends on what side of the elevator. Depends on which side. So true. Oh, because there's all going to talk about Towards the corridor. Sorry, it was the full corridor, not the double doors. Right? Because the other side of the corridor. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It looks like it's up. Or no, yeah, that's so, okay. Oh, yeah. it's a so, practice. I can do it. Start one more. Starting. 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 Yeah. You gotta do the mic tap. Oh, I are you by your amazing conversation connection? We love the space, we love your energy, so much appreciation for that. Um, I want somebody to be the one to make it a little angry again. We're all there, so. We'll do one more session and then we'll go over for lunch. But hi, everyone. My name is Leslie. Um, as I introduced myself early on, right? I am a Archivers um, Scholarship recipient. Thank you all for joining us today during our session. Um, so, for this session, we're going to actually go over our um, navigation of legal landscapes. So, as you know, my passion is law and overall, right? Um, I am a UCLA student, I am a documented first generation, and I came when I was 10 years old, right? My family um, worked in lo que es las cosechas, cosechas de café, cosechas de la de elote. Um, so I do come from a background where, you know, my family 
is for when we live in a small um, pueblecito where everyone knows each other, everyone knows what's going on. Um, and you know, it, it really empowers me to be here today with you all. Um, looking at what everyone does, looking at your careers, looking at your specialties, like it's so empowered to see all of you and you're my pro model to me, you're my inspiration to tomorrow go back to Los Angeles and say I was part of this community. I met amazing people that empower me and you know I'm more than happy to now say this is what I'm gonna go to. Go ahead and do right. Um, so thank you all for sharing your experiences for that. All right. Um, so we will actually have our representative, um, representative Delia Ramirez, but she will be running a um, few minutes late. So we're just gonna pause when she comes in and we're gonna, you know, continue our schedule. But at the moment, um, I do want to take a second and make sure that we do talk about and mention and represent those that are present with us today, which some of them are familiar to me, right? And it's amazing to see people and how pequeñas el mundo, right? Um, people that I've seen on emails, I've seen on, you know, advertisements, and I can see them now in person. So that's great and nice to see. So with us, we have, Okay, sorry about that. Um, so with the, um, we have our amazing four panelists, Katia Garcia from Chifla, Carol Solis from Make the Pro New York, Athlete Teles Martinez, a, a student at Trinity Washington University, and Dr. Elizabeth Vaquera from the George Washington University. So I want to take a second for them to also introduce themselves, um, tell us about your organization, what you do, and you know your passion around. I think we need to use the whole. Hi everyone, my name is Ayan Dayan. Um, from Social Day. I'm a student here at the Trinity Washington University studying international relations and academic studies. Um, and I pretty much am organized and I'm student, very right, and I can look smart and look good. Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, um, my name is Carol Solis. I am an attorney and I'm also the co legal director at the Logan Park. We are the largest uh, immigrant led uh, grassroots organization in New York. Uh, we focus on a lot of things that impact uh, you know, working class and other communities throughout, uh, throughout our state, uh, you know, whether it's racial law, obviously, right, but also other. Critical areas of society, including housing and workplace justice and civil rights in general. Um, we're also, you know, uh, part of a broader network within the immigrant rights movement. I'm going to pass it over to one of our dearest friends in the movement, uh, Katia Rafael Hey everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for I'm the Youth Programs Manager with Chile at the Coalition for Humane and Human Rights. I'm a DACA recipient. I'm also from LA. Um, I came here with my family when I was 11 years old. Uh, and I started in Chile uh, when I was in 2012, actually, when they helped me with my DACA renewal. Um, so I've been in the movement for a long time. I was a college student. Um, Chile is a statewide organization. Um, they organize college students, high school students, and honestly, everybody that lets themselves be organized and that wants to be in this movement. Uh, we do everything. We wear many different hats um, as staff, um, but obviously, our goal at the end is to make uh, this country fully inclusive of immigrants. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everybody. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Barrera. I'm a professor of sociology and public policy at the George Washington University. And there, I'm also the executive director of the Center of Hispanic Leadership Institute. So, as a transition, the work that my research is on undocumented young as, uh, and children and young adults. Uh, and my work is directed to Latino, Latina, Latina, Latina. Uh, just uh, you know, trying to provide that pipeline that you all were talking in the in the previous session of like how important it is that you know employers understand uh, uh, what are the you know what Latinos and Latinas and Latine are bringing to the workforce and you know asking the right questions and and, and be more culturally competent right in in the work that we all do. So thank you for being here and I'm looking forward to having a great conversation. Also, I want to say thank you and this is. Um, Arlene, Katia, Leslie, thank you for being here, putting yourself out there and, you know, sharing your experiences and putting your voice out there to share with all of us. Uh, I know it's not easy. I've spent the last 20 years and I hope to continue 20 more, hopefully, talking to undocumented young adults and you're putting yourself out there and that your stories are important and I'm glad that you're here to be sharing yours and, you know, the data. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all the work that you also do. Um, I think it's important to mention right that as a documenter, we don't fix anything. Um, we do tend to expose ourselves, but if we don't even expose ourselves, then you know, if talking personally, if I had to expose myself into saying I'm undocumented, I would have probably missed out so many opportunities. So I do encourage my students who also share their stories. Um, and just say who they are, right? Um, I think saying who they are and sharing their stories is what's going to get them wherever they, they want to be. Um, and that's what got me here today, right? So I think it's super important that wherever you are, whatever your background is, make sure you share part of who you are, but also, you know, share your experiences because all that is how I can take it as a growing opportunity. And I'm sure others can also take it. Um, and I also want to mention that back in 20, launching 2021, right, Latino Advocacy Week was meant to empower Latinos to advocate for themselves, their families, and also their communities. So this is part of what you're doing. You're also um, empowering others to go back to their communities and do the and do and keep on doing the amazing work they're, they're doing, right? Um, so part of the discussion for today is also to bring together immigration experts like that, right, to advocate and discuss the current state of deferred action for childhood arrivals, known as DACA, programming the courts and the impact of DACA decisions on local communities. Um, so it's going to be super powerful and also really informative for all of us, right? So now I do want to take um, the time to introduce Evelyn Ramirez, who is the person that got me here today. <laughs> Um, and you know, she's amazing and she's also the pro the program manager right for our dreamers. Um, thank you so much, Leslie, for being here and for sharing space and telling us your stories, and especially to each and one of you panelists as well. Um, thank you all for being here. We um at Hispanic Access in 2020 heard about the Supreme Court deciding to keep DACA. But they would still keep the law that or the rule that Trump put in place that everybody had to renew their DACA every year, which cost five hundred dollars. And not everyone had five hundred dollars, especially students like Leslie, who are undocumented and are trying to get through get through college. And so, um, we at Spending Access decided to create our dreams um, scholarship program, and we were able to actually award forty nine scholarships across the country um, in twenty twenty one to um, undocumented students uh, like Leslie. And so we are really excited to continue this conversation today because we know that DACA is still a hot topic and something that is affecting millions of lives across the country. Um, and so we are really honored um, to start this panel. And we are actually going to start off with the first question, which is um, going to be for Adeline, which is what struggles have you seen um, you and your peers face as you apply to college? As an undocumented student, I know. Uh, mental struggles, everyone. <laughs> All the struggles in the world. Um, I 
now I live in DC, but I actually grew up in a very small town in North Carolina called Gastonia. Um, ain't nothing there. <laughs> That's me and my family. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, growing up in North Carolina, growing up in a very small town, and having to do a lot of racism, a lot of just feeling left out. Um, and something else is that my family, you know, my family is very humble. Um, my mom doesn't have a formal education, so there was no way, and I'm also an only child. So who do I turn to to ask about scholarships? Yes, I was in AP classes. Yes, I was in honors classes, but um, in rural North Carolina, do I take a picture and say, hey, I'm a hero, I'm documented, uh, don't call police, but all the things help me, you know, get on this campus. And <clears throat> North Carolina is a locked out state, meaning that undocumented students are forced to pay out of state to tuition, and sometimes international tuition rates. My mom earns $12.55 out of textile mill, and my dad makes $15 in the warehouse. And for us, for me at that time, I was like $15, my dad make a bank, you know? And in reality, I was looking at these scholarship applications, at these college applications, and this application was $60. How do I have the right to ask my parents for $50 for maybe I get it, maybe I don't? Um, so definitely having to pay those students to apply. Um, thankfully, I have a scholarship uh, to go to a school at Trinity. And how did I choose my college? I chose the biggest city that I could find. And I didn't get the opportunity to even go to a Trinity before choosing it. It was really the way to search and me being like, but unfortunately, I think that being an advocate, being, being somebody who wants justice is very hard to be a student at the same time. Um, 20, I graduated in 2022. Um, throughout the past five years, really so much trauma has happened uh, politically. Uh, in Central Africa, in Central Africa, and really I got rejected from some three times from the top of the world. Um, and it, it has just been very exhausting and having to go into college and having all that, carrying all that trauma and then actually being away from the family for 13 years a lot. Um, and we were just, we just have to face so many hard decisions. My scholarship uh, only recently went out. Uh, my scholarship money recently ran out. And when I went to my advisor, I was like, well, what am I going to do? Because my family is in North Carolina, and I'm here, and I depend on the scholarship money for me to be living in the dorm. And they were like, it's your problem. So in December, I was left homeless, and I'm still homeless. Um, but because of the advocacy work that I've been doing in DC and the community, and you know, this, this family just hosted me and taking me in for now. But these are the hard decisions that you have to face. Either you get your education and you have to face all these other hardships. Like, what are you willing to sacrifice? And I think that that's the biggest um, issue, the biggest barrier. Like, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to help your family in the future? Thank you so much, um, I mean, for sharing um, and being so vulnerable and open with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, and so when we first started our dreams, actually, we assembled um, some experts ourselves. Um, I think when we had a conversation with both Dr. Raquera as to why and what do students actually need. And so that's where we decided to make the scholarship be, whether it be for doctor um, renewal, whether it be for housing, whatever the student might need, we weren't going to say what specifically it was going to be used for, but we knew that the money was going to help the our students. Um, so thank you for sharing that name and your and being vulnerable with us. Dr. Raquel, we we'll move on to you. Um, and the question is, based on the intensive research you have done, what is at stake for documented youth? <laughs> I could go for hours. Uh, there's so many things we could cover here. One that is 
the one that I've been saying and bringing up a lot in the last few months is the idea that doing nothing creates harm. Okay, and that's the situation that we are doing that and in which we are right now. We have all these people that you know they got that guy a few years ago, there's no path forward. And then threatening that, what we call in I'm a sociologist, thank you for the shout out, shout out for sociology earlier, by the way. Uh, and the, what we call liminal states, right? You are neither these nor that. Uh, but you are in this country and you are providing, you are contributing, you are either studying or you are working, you are uh, um, providing services for others, etc. Uh, but there is nowhere for you to go. That's creating harm of like not, not having any change in that and then threatening that little gain that you had and when you started taking almost for granted, right? That you could work now after you got your data. So that's what I would say that it's very, you know, that it worries me and that we see that it's creating, you know, that we are doing and there has to be this change and, you know, doing something, not keeping the things that they are the way they are because that's uh, going, you know, that's creating a lot of harm by itself. This we are traumatizing people uh, and that's, you know, that's creating a lot of mental health issues that we could be safe. Uh, many, uh, many DACA recipients. The other thing that I would like to emphasize too that is very important uh, we keep talking about that. Um, we have a lot of people that are no longer DACA recipients and they got no DACA eligible. So even if people could apply for DACA now, given how it started, we have a lot of young people who are basically, they will qualify, right, for everything except for the date of entry to the United States, that they are no longer going to be eligible because they came here after June 15, 20, uh, 2007, right? Um, Creating those divisions are hurt, uh, hurt for themselves too, right? What makes a difference that you came a day after a day before, or that you turn 15 versus turning 16 versus turning 14, right? So we are creating further differences among these uh, young people that are creating harm in itself. So those are things that I would like, you know, for us to have to keep in our in our brains and in our conversations here, like not making decisions is creating harm, threatening. Um, the, those decisions or those changes that we had put in place, and they had been the law in a way uh, for so many years, is creating additional harm. And I will share, hopefully, I get some opportunity to share some data that we've been collecting. And the last thing I would like to add to your question let's just stop um, criminalizing the parents. Um, we know, and maybe Arlene can, you know, you can say this with your own voice instead of me saying it, of like, Whenever I talk to undocumented young adults, they oh, one thing that I heard time and again is my parents are the original dreamers, right? So there is no need to criminalize parents to protect these young people. So let's make sure that you know the conversation is more inclusive. And if we want to support DACA recipients or undocumented young adults, they don't live in the vacuum. We cannot expect those young people and some of them are almost my age now are to thrive when their parents are being you know mistreated or deported etc right we all live in family we don't like those out of those families to be taken away right so if we want their livelihood and their survive we need to think in terms of the family and the community as well yeah thank you so much dr Gagera, for all of that insight. <laughs> and I definitely, um, we should definitely hit on those stats a little bit later. Um, but we are actually going to take a quick one minute break because uh, we have Congresswoman Delia Ramiro here with us. So if you want, Leslie, you can come back. And Leslie is actually going to be introducing the Congresswoman. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you everyone for your patience. I apologize for the pause, right? Um, so I am going to give a quick introduction before she comes in, right? Um, so we, I, I have the pleasure, right, to introduce our very special keynote speaker, La Congresista Delia Amide, representing the 3rd District of Illinois. She is the first Latina elected to Congress from the Midwest the daughter of working class Guatemalan immigrants. Congresswoman Ramirez is an accomplished legislator, social service director, community leader, and coalition builder who has dedicated her life career advocating for working families. Her family moved to Humboldt Park at the age of one, 
When her parents found a subsidized apartment above the church that they could finally afford. Her commitment to community and working families is shaping her life experience. Her mother crossed the border while pregnant with Delia, with Delia and worked multiple low-wage jobs to give her children, but to give her children a fighting chance to escape poverty. These experiences ignited a fire that proper propel her to fight to the rights of all working families struggling to survive, whether it be housing, justice, fully funding public schools, or immigration. Congresswoman Mendelia is a champion for immigrant families. She's fighting to make sure DACA recipients can permanently adjust their legal status, eliminate the case backlog in immigration court, push to reduce fees so that more people can file for citizenship, and will continue by the petitions to keep families together. Now let's please, uh, please help me in welcoming La Congresista Delia Ramirez. Buenos, buenas tardes. How's everyone doing today? Oh, coffee. <laughs> because we need more caffeine. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. But let me tell you, and as she said, my congresista is still settling in for me. It's been less than 100 days since I was finally sworn in uh, as the congresista of the Lancaster Congressional District. And I'll tell you the district I represent. That I've been my entire life was the only Latino district created in the entire Midwest during the census and redistricting to be able to respond to the growing Latino community in the Midwest. So I take much pride um, in being able to represent a community that shows that we are not invisible, and particularly our immigrant communities are invisible while also recognizing that we still have a long way to go for representation. I should not be the first Latina in the entire Midwest in Congress, not in 2023, sure have, should sure have been in 2022. So we have a lot of work to do. And with that, I know the responsibility I have in this moment. I'm so grateful for the Hispanic Access Foundation to invite me to share space with you today as you kick off the critical panel discussion about protecting dreamers in the DACA debate. I just literally left Homeland Security Committee hearing. I serve as a ranking member in the committee, and I serve in the subcommittee on board, where I'm the only Latina and the only member of Congress in a mixed status marriage. Truthfully, I'm the only one in that committee, but I'm the only member of Congress in the entire Congress. Uh, with a husband who just got his back at home last night. In every space I find myself in, and especially spaces such as the Homeland Security Committee, where we have jurisdiction over border enforcement, I will always center our shared humanity in our, in our immigration policy. I will always stand up to dangerous rhetoric that seeks to dehumanize and criminalize people. Today, as I waited through the panels, and I heard the various witnesses speak. I had my little notepad. It gave us a notepad for every committee. And my notepad became a scorecard. And the number of times that we refer to our community as aliens, 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 the illegals, the illegals. And I was so saddened and frustrated by then words coming out of some colleagues and witnesses have been saying, we have to address the invasion of the Mexicans. Invasion. I heard someone else say, we have an infestation, as if we are cockroaches, bed bugs. That is how some people see our community. That is how some people see our children. That is why it's so critical that the Hispanic Access Foundation has convened us today. The power of building shared knowledge shared resources and organizing collectively to deliver for our families, for our loved ones, for our own selves is one of our greatest tools. Our families and our communities cannot be conveniently divided into documentation statuses and therefore neither can our advocacy because we know that together we are stronger. Unfortunately, 
I won't be able to stay for the panel today. I have to go back to a press conference in a few minutes, but I want to talk to you about how we partner together to protect DACA recipients and all their needs. In the face of legal uncertainty, we have to pursue every avenue available to prevent deportations, but not by pitting one part of the immigrant community against the other. And this includes calls for executive actions that the president could take today. That includes using executive authority to grant parole for all undocumented immigrants in order to prevent deportations so that we can keep families and communities together while also broadly issuing work permits. In addition to executive authorities, we can also look to legislation in Congress. We must continue to call for comprehensive, humane immigration reform through the American Dream and Promise Act. And we can also advance additional legislation. For example, I, right now, am working on legislation that my team is actively seeking input on, on how to expand protections from deportation and family separations by examining ways to use the most inclusive definitions for family that actually reflects family and community ties beyond spouses and parents. It is time we deliver on the promise we have made to our dreamers and to all of our, of our immigrants with our legal status. And I'll tell you when I say that, you've heard other politicians say that over and over. Well, I have a partner back at home who tells me, I don't care what party you have. I'm just so tired of empty promises. I'm just so tired that they keep telling us, maybe next election, maybe next Congress. The reality that this should not be a political issue. When we talk about the contribution of our dreamers and a migrant community, for example, our dreamers who contribute more than $6.2 billion in taxes for our federal government. We should see this as a necessity for this country to finally pass a pathway to citizenship for those that have contributed and made our country the best of the country. And I know firsthand the challenges and I know the constant fear that our families live in every day. I do have the uncle that's 64 years old working at a diner, exhausted from 70 hours a week, who has been in this country for 35 years and put four boys to college. And he asked me, Delia, hasta cuando? Cuando llegará el día que ya no tengo que vivir en el miedo que venga un oficial y me deporte y me separe de mi familia? This is exactly why we are here today. Your advocacy is critical. And I promise you, as more of us are in these spaces who personally experience the impact of separation, who personally experience the fear mongering that keeps our families separated, you have an ally, a partner, one of yours in Congress who will fight like hell every single day until we stop talking about maybe next time but we finally have full immigration reform and our dreamers no longer have to dream. So I wanna say congratulations to the scholarship recipients. And I wanna thank the Hispanic Access Foundation for your dedication to directly deliver resources that make a difference. I wanna thank everyone for your work, for your engagement, for your labor, for your vulnerability. Keep doing this and keep showing up. Thank you. We're so thankful um, to the Kelly for the conversation today. And um, I know the first one you said is we need to fight and we have to work together and, and fight this together. We will continue our panel. Uh, so I'll give this over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Ramirez, as well as Mike Finn. Um, and we're going to continue our panel discussion. Thank you all for your flexibility and We'll switch it back over to our main panelists. Um, so the next question is for Harold. Um, and based off of that great kind of uh, intro by the Congresswoman, where does DACA currently stand in the courts? This is this is the panel for like a lot of our troops. I think um, because I can talk. 
for a long time about where the profit is for the sports. Um, for some background, right? So, like, like a quick show of hands here, who like remembers, you know, all the like media headlines, right? Like, come from the office talking about the termination of Dodgers. Yeah. Um, leading into the 20, uh, 2020 election, right? One of the most big promises was the, uh, that this would no longer be the main headline in the group, right? That uh, there would be a legislative solution, that there would be a path forward, right? Because DACA, I know we're talking about Green in particular, but DACA was never itself a dream, right? The dream has always been permanent inclusion in the society that we call home. Um, and so, as, as Emily mentioned right in the intro, 2020 was also that moment when we saw the Supreme Court hand down with this key decision on DACA saying that the Trump administration's attempt to end it was unlawful. At Make the Road, uh, one, of our, one of our cases uh, was one of those cases that went to the Supreme Court and helped defend, you know, against that, that unlawful termination of the prior administration. Today, we are still class counsel, right? So my, my question to you guys about, remember about you know, termination of that kind of stuff, the point was we would no longer be doing this work, right? So this work would be slowing down. Instead, what we found out was that after the election, places like Nature Road, and then we're still uh, leading one of our litigation cases in New York, we're still doing the work to, to try to build job work, right? And that's because there have been at least two four cases in the DACA context that have continued to be battleground, right, for, for DACA, the DACA program itself. The other case, aside from ours, is the one in Texas, right? And that's the one that I think many of you probably heard about as well. In 2021, there was a district judge who ruled that the DACA program went on longer and that it needed to, to, to be terminated, right? There was an appeal, and the federal appellate court that, that hears appeals out of Texas, the Fifth Circuit, uh, ruled last year, right, that that was right, that DACA is unlawful, and that it should not exist. This has all been happening slowly, like we have been sort of in this moment where it's felt like maybe things are not as bad on the issue anymore because there's a new person in the White House, there's a new administration. But the reality is that in the courts, right, the attacks on programs like DACA have continued. And where we are right now is that DACA continues to be on a lifeline, right? And I open this by saying this is the moment of our truth, and that's, that's the truth, right? It is 100% true that today people with DACA, right, those who were able to apply way back when and who were able to continue to live new, those hundreds of thousands are still living year to year Right, renewal to renewal until somebody says otherwise. And that is just a really awful way to try and organize your life, yours and your family's, right? Um, and so where we are right now is that we are back after the appellate court ruled, right, that DACA was unlawful. They gave the federal government a chance to essentially go back, right, and try to right, do it the right way, right? To come up with Come up with a way to to build DACA. Well, that's what the Biden administration promised. So what they did was what the federal government did was they went back to the agencies and they created recreated DACA, right? But this time through the regulatory process. And the thinking was, well, now we went through the right process, so right, like DACA should be fine now. This is this is like political, but also legal. Right, like the, the in, a, in a normal world, if an agency follows its own legal procedures, then that should be the end of the conversation. It's lawful. But what we all know is that we're dealing with uh, a court system right, in Texas that has shown time after time that it is opposed to the program that is not there. And so, what we expect to happen, you know, in the next year or so. Is that the, the court system in Texas will again unfortunately rule that DACA is unlawful and we'll be back in this moment that we've been in for the last few years, which is people living, you know, year to year, not knowing if they're able to review their DACA uh, status. Right now, literally at this moment, right now, the federal government and the state of Texas have been going back and forth uh, in their case in Texas on arguing, right, and written briefs. We expect by April 6th. 
uh, uh, for a federal court of Texas is going to set out essentially the next step in that case, which would likely be uh, some kind of oral argument, right? Like in court, people are really and they argue back and forth about the merits of the case. We expect that to happen at some point this year. We expect that after that, there'll be another appeal. And what we're likely to see is another appeal to the Supreme Court. If all of that sounds confusing, it is. It is like super confusing. And on a very human level, like just again, try to think about, you know, like what we're just talking about here, which is trying to organize your life around this path of appeal. It is, it is really like an awful way to, to try to live. And it's, just, it's a challenging thing. Um, so that's kind of where things are now. I, 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 this wasn't meant to be like a pet talk. It's like a real talk. It's like exactly what's going on. Thank you for that, um, Harold. And thank you for the work and educating us a little bit about where DACA currently stands. It is a very intricate uh, system, the court system. And so kind of going back to the, to the undocumented student community. Um, Kathy, this question for you. Um, as an organizer, what is the biggest misconception that you hear about undocumented youth? I think the biggest misconception that I hear is that we're young, that that recipients are youth, right? When we talk about dreamers, when we talk about that recipients, uh, we often think, oh, like, you know, the children, like the, the young people, right? But in reality, I really want to, you know, emphasize that we're adults now. Um, I'm 31 years old. Um, I received that in 2012. So it's been a bunch of years, as Harold said, that have been, you know, it's been a roller coaster. Uh, but the DACA recipients that we now have, have families, they have kids. Some of them are buying homes. Um, you know, my sister is a DACA recipient as well. She has a child. And her biggest fear is what's going to happen if DACA gets taken away? Am I going to be separated from, from my child, right? Um, the, his, uh, her partner is also that recipient. So I, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. But also another thing is that not all um, undocumented folks are DACA recipients, right? So what does that mean? It means that the majority of undocumented young people living in the country have no data. Only around 60,000 people have data right now. And that's a very, very low number, right? And so uh, we have to understand that, you know, data, as Harold mentioned, was never the solution. It was meant to be a band-aid. And so what we're asking now is for something that is permanent, we don't want no more work permits, period, right? We went through that. We know what happens with something temporary. We need something that is permanent and that won't be easily taken away when the next president comes, right? Uh, and we also need something inclusive because again, like not everybody that's documented is actually young either. Uh, my parents are documented and you know when they wouldn't qualify for the Dreams and Promise Act, they wouldn't qualify for DACA. And what we need is a legislation that actually encompasses uh, adults uh, and the younger generation that is coming, and also that recipients, TPS holders, refugees, right? There's a bunch of other community members that won't fall in legislation that only encompasses young people, right? Um, and I'm very grateful to have DACA, but I think uh, we really need to understand all those misconceptions and understand the truth of the documented community uh, so that we can actually know what will be the right path for legislation. Um, so just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. For that insight. And so we're talking about solutions to, as you said, um, something more permanent than just a bandage solution. So this question is for Harold. Um, what is currently being proposed by the House and Senate as a solution for dreamers? All right. So this is this is maybe the pet talk. This is like maybe the part right where it's like, all right, you know what the problem is, what do we do about it? Right? A lot of that starts with obviously like people in this room, people on family community, getting in touch with organizations that show up, like, like getting in touch with people for a kind of 
putting the pressure out there, right? To support your friends, your neighbors who are part of it, right? And all these predicaments. Because um, this stuff doesn't happen just it's not going to happen, you know, without, without that kind of effort. So, two things. One, we're just coming out of a congressional cycle for the last two years, like a post congressional cycle under the Biden administration, where we saw a flurry, like we saw several different um, legislative proposals put on the table that would help not only, you know, for the doctor, but also many of the other communities that Pat was talking about. Right? Um, you heard one of the legislative uh, proposals from the congressman, this, this idea called the Human Promise Act. I'll start there and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this other piece of legislation that, you know, in in the work that we do when we're talking with community members and we're hoping to organize, it's the piece of legislation that always generates the most excitement because it's the one that feels the fairest, it's the one that feels the most permanent, it's the one that feels the most inclusive. I'll start with Dream and so Dream and Thomas is an idea is a legislative le legislative concept that's been floated around for years at this point. And the basic concept here is that it would offer certain people who came here as you know young folks, usually the age of around 18, right? Um, it would allow them to have a pathway to get a green card if they need certain academic or workplace requirements. If that sounds familiar to you, it should, right? It is literally built off a little bit around DACA, right? A similar idea. Came here relatively young. You are, you know, if you graduated or you're in school, you get an absolute green card. There's like obviously other details because that's how immigration law works. There's always, you know, there's always details where the government is like peeling people out, pe peeling people out or excluding them. But the general framework is, is that, right? It's you know, relatively young when you enter, you work or you went to school and, and you've been here as you know, this time. That's dream and promise. It would also help certain folks who have TPS. TPS is a temporary uh, form of immigration status called temporary protected status, and it's afforded to people who you know are coming from countries that have you know endured different sort of like natural or man-made disasters, basically. Um, but the idea is to help those two communities through this piece of legislation finally get on a path to getting a green card and therefore on a path to inclusion, right, within that society on a more permanent uh, basis. Um, we saw Congress try to, you know, include this in their last legislative cycle. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth, you know, a lot of like funky and like messed up details about how, how Congress works and doesn't work, right, like how sausage is made, it's like not to keep about it. Um, ultimately, it didn't happen. Your promise was not included. There have been years and years and years of discussion on how this is the piece of legislation that has bipartisan support, aka that both parties have supported. We see yet to see that come to fruition. And so that's really disappointing. The other big piece of legislation that has been, you know, making its way uh, within the immigrant rights movement and also within Congress is something that's called registry. And it sounds super boring, right? Registry sounds like a piece of paper you can register people. Um, but it's actually a piece of existing immigration law and it's been around since 1929. It's literally still part of our law right now. The only problem is that it's outdated. The way registry works is that it allows long-term members of our communities to apply to get green. It's that simple. There is no, did you go to school? There's no, did you go to work? There's none of that. It's literally focused more on how long you've been in this community and getting the law to recognize what is essentially a fact of the right? You've been here and therefore you should be recognized as a part of the society. This has been a law that's been updated, I think, about four times, if I remember correctly, um, over the years. The last time it was updated was actually uh, when the Reagan administration. Um, and it had bipartisan support back then. Um, we've been working, you know, with organizations like Trilla, they warned us this week, they've been uh, leaders on, on this piece of work. Um, but, you know, we've been working to essentially get the dates, right, that controls how long you need to be here. We've been working to update that date and make it more recent and now to bring it to the 21st century. And again, the idea there is that it would, of course, help. Dreamers, so of course, help people with DACA, but would also bring everybody else who's also been here and is clearly, you know, 
suffering and enduring all the all the pains that come with being excluded from Awesome. So thank you so much, Harold, for that kind of insight and breaking it down for us. This next question goes to Dr. Rakea. What motivating factors have you seen play a role in students' decisions to continue their education as an educator? Well, as an educator, mostly we are there to support our students, right? So we need to do the work to help them find happiness to continue with education. And what one thing that I, when we talk to undocumented uh, students, uh, really higher education, um, they tell us our sons of our students who didn't know what to do with us. And that's very much what you were saying earlier. Like they say, well, when you say I'm undocumented, say, well, I cannot do anything for you, which is not true. There is a lot we can be doing. Uh, uh, so there is a lot of training that should happen. And when we see schools that they were hard and they, uh, as I was saying earlier, culturally competent staff, staff that has doing that has done their homework, the students have more pathways for them to choose because you shouldn't have to just choose the school, you know, because it's the only one that gives you funding. I mean, there might be other schools that you could have applied and they also have funding and they didn't even offer you or no one helped you apply for them or telling you that you could ask for waivers, right? When you apply to schools that you shouldn't even be paying those $60 so you can put those $60 to better use. So, as as educators make a huge, huge difference, uh, counselors need to know their job and how to help their diverse students that they work with or find someone who can help those students. So don't condemn to someone else and say you cannot help. We can help our students and students can be helped in different ways. So that's one important thing. The other thing that I've seen a lot and it's very encouraging at the same time, you know, um, it's like this sense of community. Many of the of the Students, the young adults that I've talked to that in higher education, they always talk about how getting involved in immigrant um, uh, organizations and uh, immigrant, um, 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 yeah, organizations has made a difference because you can find others that share your same plea, your same struggles, and that they can help you navigate that process. That process. Uh, because they've done it before you or they are doing it with you. So having some sort of sense of community, uh, whether it's with uh, immigrant uh, nonprofit organizations that you're working with or within, you know, if you end up in college, within your own university, uh, finding that those those groups uh, that they can help you develop belonging and knowledge, right? Um, so those are those are two uh, two big ones that I would like to uh, to highlight that they come over and over again. What I would say uh, for those of you, hopefully some of you are in education, whether you're a student, you're a professor, like I myself, or your staff, if someone comes and shares that information with you, it's like, hey, I'm undocumented, hey, I have that account, I don't know what to do. Don't, don't turn their ear back. Like, go and ask questions for that student. Do not disclose their identity without their permission, but I'm sure there's someone in your organization that can give you more information. Create those networks so you can help the same way that you would uh, help a student that is having a mental health crisis, um, whether it's not mental documented. The same process, try to get information. This is our job to help our students, and sometimes it has to be academics, and sometimes it's an academic. So take that responsibility. Don't, don't turn your back, but learn. Thank you so much for that call to action. And so um, this uh, next question is for you, Adeline. What does immigration reform mean to you? I think immigration reform, um, in reality, we'll never have a real just full solution for everyone, right? Uh, immigration reform, like you said, the closing to it will be the registry. Um, I think that back in 2017, 2018, when the whole Trump thing happened and folks were starting to do the advocacy again um, for the Dream Act, there was the there was Dream Act, and then there was um, legislation that there was a proposal from Tom Sotis, um, which is the same from North Carolina, and it, it included a lot of um, border protection and a lot of that being very hard. And I think that many times we are put into these 
solving these situations, other situations, where they ask us to what they want to do. Um, yeah, I'm speak for all my community people, but I speak for myself. You know, it's like, it's so hard. Um, because how am I supposed to be here in the United States without my family? Um, how am I, like, do I sacrifice my family for what, for a call to go for us? But I'm not even trying my business here, being part of international relations, but I'm not even trying to do jobs. Everything is about to just be a citizen to have some type of, um, to have some type of residency or some type of actual legal status. Immigration reform to me is that I would guarantee that my mom will be safe and the people in the state of my community because everybody's like, oh, you know, you know, you know, why am I? Because I know I'm not a citizen, I know I'm not a resident here. Like, and when it comes down to the law, then they will ask me, well, and I feel like um, we continue to be categorized and we're not going to be two years and we're and I think that that's a way that the system is trying to make us for us to basically be you know, comfortable traveling and being talked about in the community. If it's our parents, if it's the being beautiful, if, you know, who is going to take us to refugee or coming from uh, Venezuela? Uh, like, who, who's next? And I feel like, I personally feel like immigration needs to be that particular location of my family and the guarantee that. My mom is not going to be there. Folks from the older generation are going to be there. And honestly, the younger generation, me in college right now, there are younger students who have, they have asked me something about internships. And I was like, oh, yeah, all you have to do is just like take a picture of your work permit. And they were like, girl, I don't have a work permit. And I was like, but you're so young. Like, you should be part of DACA. And then I fail to realize that. That they weren't because of the cutoff days. And it just makes me so angry because these are like, like they said, like we aren't all alone. We're 24 years old. If this dream life were to happen, what I have to wait like what 10 years in order to actually be able to get my citizenship? I'm gonna be so old, y'all. Like <laughs> at some point I have to convince the sign I don't want to get married. I don't want it to come from um, you know. Whenever I talk to my mentors, they're like, well, have you thought about being here? No, like, <laughs> you know, this is not allowed to live. And I don't want, I don't want my safety, my, my ability to live and create and generate here to be tied to a person and a country. Because, you know, international relations, y'all, like, I even look at it in people's sleep. And that's what I that's what I want. I want to be able to live my youth and I want my mom to be able to live her life. It saddens me that my mom one day came up to me and told me, you know, I'd rather be poor than be here in this country. And I was like, Mama, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to break it to you. Like we still poor here, but I get it, you know. Like it's so hard to live here in a country where it's hard for me. Uh, a 24, I've been, I've been in the U.S. for what, 17 years? I've been in the U.S. for 17 years, you know, my family's culture, I uh, know the language. I can't even imagine how hard it is for my mom, who can't get a good job, who doesn't, still doesn't know the language, because, you know, she said she's Mexican forever, and not living to learn English, and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> Like, how hard is it for her? I'm 24, my mom and I came to the U.S. when she was like 26. And as I'm getting closer to that age, I'm like, this is so hard. Like, my mom truly is a superhero. And, like, if I'm going to benefit from something, my mom better benefit from something. Yeah. Um, Thank you for kind of wrapping this up a little bit for us, but not quite yet, so we're excited. Um, but thank you for sharing those words. I mean, I know that it is hard to think about our parents um, and to think of the sacrifices that they've made. Um, and so kind of opening it up to all four of you, this next question is, based on what we, what we have discussed, how can we advocate for undocumented youth in the community? What do we do first? Um, so I think 
the first thing is that we need everybody, like not only undocumented people. Like I feel like I'm tired of sharing my story. You know, I'm tired of going through that emotional roller coaster. It's necessary, but I also think that we need people that are citizens uh, to stand up. Right? We need you if you're able to, if you're registered to vote, if you, if your representative is not immigrant friendly, is not supportive of any immigration reform, we need you all to lobby them. We need you to protest outside their offices if that's what's going to take, right? Because the only way that we're going to be able to get registry or any sort of immigration reform is if we actually are loud and we all come together. Um, I think uh, we're, no one is free until we're all free, right? And so we need everybody um, to really stand up. Um, obviously, with the stories of undocumented people in the front, but we need them, like, we need you all behind us, right? Um, and so I think if you're not aware of the issue, um, you know, hopefully this panel will help you. But also go look up a little bit more about the registry, right? Uh, about other um, things happening with immigration. Join an organization that is uh, like an event organized by, by an organization, a protest. If you haven't done so, I really encourage you all to do it, right? Because I think this issue has been going on for years and years and years, and it's tiring. Our undocumented community is literally dying on document, right? And so I think the only way we're gonna be able to do it is if we all take the streets and actually show, you know, our voices and our support. Uh, this is more like on the organized side, right? I like to throw down, and I think that you know, all together, that's the way we're gonna go about pressuring the government to do something about it. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll see you all at the next event. Um, that's happening. Um, I think something that's very important is that the faculty, I think we get this question a lot, and like, what can we do? What can we do? Go look for what you can do. Like, it's not just about, oh, you know, like, yes, we're going to show up to this rally. Do you not have undocumented people within your circle? I think that's my question for everyone. And if you don't, why? <laughs> you know, and if you do have somebody who's undocumented in your circle, your community, what are you doing to support this family? If you know you want a financial situation that is good, why don't you ask, be like, hey, you know, here's some money for some grocery? What are you doing to alleviate the the pain, the the suffrage that we have to face? being undocumented, if you're going to be in solidarity with undocumented people, you're going to have to be uh, ready and prepared to help them in all the aspects. When they don't have money, you know, maybe they need some a ride somewhere to their job. Maybe they need help filing taxes. Like, I don't find my taxes to your job. I don't know if you're not a So those are things that you can help. And, you know, if you're a professor, helping people understand and navigate what does college actually look like? Like to this day, y'all, I'm like, I'm like a super super team at this point. <laughs> and I still don't know what a team is. And so these things are important because at the end of the day, we are undocumented immigrants. This is an entire new culture, an entire new aspect. It's an entire country that we are coming into and we don't know how to navigate it. So I think actually working and being solidarity with people who Raising those three people are not going to all of this person. Um, I would just add, like, go home, talk to your friends, talk to people you need to see, like, who are in your life, right? There is a lot of misinformation circling around, a whole lot of topics, but particularly when it comes to there's a real battle going on right now to sway people right to either like further demonize immigrants um, and it's happening in very like clear ways but it's also kind of very subtle um right and even right now we're in the thick of things with this whole conversation around asylum seekers who are being sent to different parts of the country right 
and communities are being pitted against one another. Uh, but in reality, right, it's immigration law is about who's in and who's out. And so as long as we're pointing the finger at somebody else and saying we should be out, you're also kind of pointing the finger at yourself. So talk to your friends. Uh, try as much as possible, right? Or like, help people understand that this is a broader fight, but it's it's really you know really about at the end of the day about inclusion. That's all this is about. Um, I'm not gonna say vote because that just goes without saying. Like if you are eligible to vote and if you are you have that power and that that ability, then use it because it is really critical, right, in a system where laws depend on the passage of, 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 of you know, Congress doing something, they listen to votes, right? And so that, that's just like a key part of all of this. So please uh, engage. You are not going to say both, but I'm going to say both. <laughs> As Katia was telling us, like, activists, they put themselves out there, but they need all of us behind you and next to you, and you know, asking what else can we do, right? And I would like to take up this point on voting. When we talk about voting, many of us think of the presidential elections. There's way more places where we can make a difference. Where do we live every day? In our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our job places? Voting things that matter. There is education workers, there is a emergency, there is like local uh, places. Those of you that can vote, make your voice heard there. Those little you know spaces or local local elections make a huge difference because that's where we live our everyday life. So if those spaces where we live are more friendly to immigrant communities. That's gonna make a huge difference on like what streets they choose to go to work, and you know what streets they need to avoid to get to school because they know that there's checkpoint there. And you, as a local resident, as a voter, or someone who's gonna represent that community, can make changes. And we've seen that happen again and again in small communities that come together to rally for other communities that might be more disempowered. So be that person that does something. Uh, and think about it, I mean, not just as a presidential election, but think at your uh, very, very local level where you can make immediate and very powerful change for, you know, in this case, we're talking about immigrants, but even other communities as well. Well, thank you all for your insight and your advice. And definitely, um, we also have an advocacy toolkit that we just released on Friday. So definitely check that out where it breaks it down from local, state, and federal levels for those of you that are able to vote. And definitely keep in mind as you advocate tomorrow what we've discussed in this immigration panel. Thank you again to the panelists. Um, this concludes our panel. For everyone that's here, um, we are going to be having another.